after this very lively morning, the dialogue between experts on, between the Buddhist and the Vedanta traditions, we are now having an afternoon with yet another discipline of contemplation, Jain meditation, and in particular the practical aspect of the, the preksha. So there will be practical instructions, examples of applications, also medical applications, and in particular we will have scientific studies performed in India on preksha meditation and its effects. So this is a nice example on the secular practice that you proposed two days ago. You will see three new faces on stage. Some of them you know already, the others you know. And for the attendants, I would like to briefly um, introduce them to you. All the way to the right, we have Arch H.R. Nagendra. I was told that one can use the abbreviations and that it is actually requested. He's the President and Vice Chancellor of the Swami Vivekananda Yoga University in Bangalore. Bangalore. Correct. He has co authored about 35 books on yoga and um, nearly three, 35 or 40 research papers in engineering and in yoga. He got awards from the Ministry of Health for his initiatives in promoting scientific analysis of yoga research. And he's a consultant in yoga to many universities all over the world, in Australia, in the US, and other countries. He joined the Vivekananda Kendra, which is a service mission, as a honorary director of training in 1975. Then he spent a whole decade in developing yoga and yoga therapy programs. And then he shifted to the headquarters to Bangalore, where he still is. And he tries to translate the vision of Swami Vivekananda technique to go combine the best of the pragmatics in the East and the pragmatics in the West, if I understand correctly. Now to his left is Shirley Telly. She got her degrees, uh, the master degree in biologic sciences from, from Goa Medical College, then her master in philosophy and neurophysiology and a PhD in neurophysiology from the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore. Now she is a director of research at uh, Panyala Yoga Peeth uh, Haridawa. I probably make mistakes here. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> and he's the head of the Indian Council of Medical Research Center for Advanced Research in Yoga and Neurophysiology at Bangalore. And she also has a respectable number of scientific publications in peer reviewed journals on yoga and the effects of yoga on physiological parameters which led to a number of rewards from the Indian Council of Medical Research, from the John Templeton Foundation, and also from uh, the Fulbright Foundation for Traveling. Then to my left, I have Muni, Muni Ji Mahendra Kumar. He must be known to you, all of you, from literature and from reading. He is a scholar of very many diverse disciplines, and what I read here makes me ad admire. It's physics, mathematics, bioscience, and philosophy. He's also an expert in ancient history and meditation, and competent in, in a large number of languages, modern languages that some of us speak, but also of ancient languages, Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Pali all this in this head. He is author of more than 60 books and the honorary professor at uh, Chain Vishiva Bharti University. And all these different activities earned him the uh, epithet of a human computer, whatever that means. He graduated from the University of Bombay in 1957, then initiated, he was initiated as a Jain monk in 1957, 
And then he must have traveled more than 10,000 miles barefoot through India. Unimaginable for somebody who is always driving around with cars. <laughs> and of course, as you would imagine, he made very significant contributions to research in Jain canonical literature. And we are very much looking forward to your contribution. Now to your left, His Holiness, Chimpa, I don't have to present anymore. Rajesh, you have already seen him several times on stage. He's from Bangalore as well. He's a cognitive scientist and heads the Institute for Cognitive Science at Bangalore University. And Richie needs no further introduction. Um, he is the incorporation of, what did you say, the scientist? Uh, I forget the name. Uh, the scientist guru. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Muniji, the microphone, the floor, and the time is yours. I hope it's on. Yes, yes it makes something. Thank you, sir. I bow my head to the adorable ones, Namo Arahantanam. His Holiness, Dalai Lama Ji, all the participants and discussions on the stage here, and all the dignitaries, scientists, philosophers, and the spiritual leaders before us. My subject is the scientific study of the effect of Jain contemplative practices, which I will denote as JCP, on human biology and behavior. First of all, first of all let us have the background in two aspects. First is the historical and traditional background. There are some archaeological evidence which show that the Jain contemplative practices date back to Lord Rishabh, the first Tirthankara, while Lord Mahavira was contemporary of Buddha, 599 to 527 BC, is believed to be the propounder of the prevalent Jain contemplative practices. Acharya Mahapragya, who developed this Praksha meditation system after a thorough research in the Agams, the most ancient available canonical literature of the Jains. Acharya Mahapragya, at the age of 90, had just passed away this year you know, in, on 9th of the May. So we have lost a very great scholar and a sadhak, a spiritual practitioner, just four months ago. The other background is the metaphysical base. In Jain metaphysics, every living organism, which we call as jiva, consists of two entities. One is the soul and other is the body. Body is again of three types. One is the subtle most, which is called as karma body. Other is subtle, which is called tejas body or we can translate it as an electromagnetic body. And the third is the gross physical body which is before us. Actually, there is a hierarchy of how the soul and the physical gross body will work. There is a step by step which we'll see later on how the message from soul, <coughs> which is the seat of consciousness, it delivers all its message of knowledge and action to the gross body and through the gross body we have all the behavior before us. The Tejas body, which is a link between the karma, that is subtle body, subtle most body and the gross physical body. Karma is a very common word terminology to all uh, philosophies, most of them of India. But they have uh, various, uh, uh, there is difference in the significance. Karma in Jainology, in Jain philosophy, is very special type of material particles or energy which get bound with the soul and 
this bondage of karma is the cause of reincarnation. Unless a soul becomes free from all bondage of karma, it cannot attain the free state or emancipation. The preksa, systematic practice of preksa meditation is proved to bring about the change in attitudes and behavior and ultimately it can lead a soul to final liberation or emancipation. Now let us see what is Preksa meditation system as it was developed by Acharya Mahapragya, by Thoreau Research, in which he had consulted more than 100 books on ancient yoga system of Jaina. And they correlated them with the modern scientific aspects of neuroscience, etc. And this system, which is in practice now, I shall just describe to you, there are seven steps. The first step comprises precondition, which is sine qua non. It requires a secluded place, of course, and a proper body posture and a proper hand posture. Then steadiness of the body is practiced because steadiness of mind is not possible without actually uh, attaining complete steadiness of the body. So that is called Kaya Gupti. Kaya Gupti is again a sine qua non for all meditation. And another very major precondition is inner silence. We can attain inner silence only by relaxing the vocal cords. So that practice is required. And when this practice is achieved, one becomes completely having inner silence. These are the preconditions. In the second step, we recite a mantra. Sometimes the mantra is in form of some syllable. Arham is a very special Jain mantra, very ancient Jain mantra, Arham. Also we recite Om. Om is also considered to be a Jain mantra from the point of view that the five uh, adorable, five obeisances paid the tributes paid to the highest souls. There are Namo Arhantanam, Namo Siddhanam, Namo Ayriyanam, Namo Vajjayanam, Namo Loe Sabbasaunam. That is included in Om. So Om is also accepted as a Jain mantra in Jain tradition. And there may be no syllable. We only recite what is called a nestle sound, which we do in Brahmari Pranayam, that is producing the sound like humming bee for a long time. And it will create a protective shield of sound energy which will protect a meditation practitioner from the external effects. The third is the aim and the result. Aim that is the Preksha Sutra. The Sutra is given in ancient scriptures. It says, see yourself through yourself. Sampikhaye apaga mapayenam. That is the soul is to be perceived by the soul. The seer is the soul, the seen is the soul. And then we have the resolve. Every practitioner first make a resolve. I practice meditation for purification of my chitta, that is psyche. Then we move to the fourth step, which is called as kayot sarga, that is relaxation with self-awareness. In this, we try to attain complete relaxation of each and every part, each and every muscle, each and every nerve of the body through auto-suggestion by concentration of mind on each part and try to attain complete relaxed condition after measurement through the equipments like electroencephalograph, it is found a good practitioner of Kajotsar can produce at once the alpha waves in his brain. And the next step is the fifth step is the practice of internal journey, which we call as Antar Yatra. This internal <coughs> journey starts from the lower end of the spinal cord, which is called as Sakti Kendra, and the Chitta is taken to the upper part of the brain, and in this way, the Prana energy from the center of energy goes upwards to the center of knowledge situated in the brain, and it, it gives energy it energizes all these psychic centers which are situated in the spinal cord and the brain. In the sixth step, 
he practiced actual meditation, preksha meditation. The word preksha is very familiar word. Preksha means to see, to perceive. When a person sits as a prekshak, he is called prekshak. When he sees everything, he is called prekshak or drashta. So prekshak is a very familiar word, see. But here seeing or perception means inner perception. The seer, that is the soul or the consciousness, try to perceive itself. The various aspects of soul are to be perceived through concentration of our chitta, on perception of various phenomena. The first perception is that of breathing, which we call it Swasha Preksha. Swasha Preksha has two alternatives. Either you may perceive your prolonged conscious breathing. You have to breathe with a long duration and you have to perceive consciously your breathing or the breathing through alternate nostrils. You breathe through one and you inhale through one and exhale through the other and vice versa. The other, ob other object of perception may be perception of body in which subtle vibrations of prana, that is vital energy, they are to be perceived throughout the body from the toe up to the head by concentrating the mind on each part and after certain practice we start getting vibrations, subtle vibrations of the prana in each and every part. The third mode is the perception of psychic centers. These are the Chaitanya Kendras. They are, they are similar or they can be correlated with the chakras concept in the yoga system. Chakra concept in yoga system and Chaitanya Kendra, which is a very old ancient term in Jain scriptures, it is also called as Karana. Karana and Chaitanya Kendra are ancient terms which we have, and now we call them as psychic centers. As a matter of fact, there are hundreds and hundreds of psychic centers, but we have identified very uh, prominent, eminent centers. Out of them, the 13 centers are given in the photo, center of knowledge, each by each center, and up to the center of energy. And in next, we had a perception of the psychic colors, that is Lesia, Lesha is a very ancient concept of psychic color. It is believed that each organism has a kind of Lesha psychic color and the psychic color has the effect on human emotion and behavior. So we call it Lesha Dhyan. Then we have the last perception that is perception of thoughts. A person just perceives the thoughts which occurs in the mind and a situation comes when the train of thoughts completely ceases and it becomes completely thoughtless. Nirvikal, he can become. And this is, these are the sixth step, that is Preksha meditation. And the seventh step, which is also very important, is the step which we call as Anupreksha, contemplation and auto-suggestion. It is Anupreksha and Bhavana, in which a person has to concentrate fully on one of the psychic center with one of the psychic color, and then repeat the suggestion which he wants to inculcate. It may be relating to the truth. Suppose I want to uh, cultivate the idea, the notion of uh, transitoriness, anitya anupreksha. I want to um, have this conviction in my uh, mind that everything is in transitory, nothing is permanent. So I will have anitya anupreksha going on repeating the same theme with concentrated mind, relaxed condition, deep breathing. And in this way, this is inculcated in my subconscious mind. In the same way, when I want to achieve any positive attitude, say, for example, compassion or fearlessness, then I have to do the anupreksha of karuna bhavana or abhay anupreksha. In this way, there are so many anuprekshas described in scriptures as well as new anuprekshas are also discovered by experience and that is practiced. So in this way, these are the main steps of preksha meditation. Then there are certain auxiliary exercises in which yoga, yogic exercises, breathing exercises, pranayama, recitation of mantra, mudra, etc. They are also practiced to assist the preksha meditation. Now let us see the process of self-transmutation by reversing 
the vicious circle of karmic bondage. It is believed that the universe is without beginning, without end. The existence of soul and karma, bound karma, it is also in the same way anadi anand. Anadi, there is no beginning. Now by practice of meditation, we can bring about the end to the bondage of soul and karma. And this is the process how we do it. In this process, just first we see how karmic bondage is a vicious circle. The karmic bondage results in karmic fusion. Any karmic bondage which is incurred in any time, in any life, any time in the, this life or in past life, when it gives its fruition, it, it, it becomes fructified, then it gives rise to subtle karmic expressions, the primal drives, which are called as adhyavasaya. They give message of attachment and aversion to the link body, tejas sari. Now, link body is the link between karma body and gross physical body. So, the, the reason of karmic fusion will either create the attachment or it will create aversion and this message will be given to the link body which will, with the help of the psychic color, lesia, uh, effect the psyche, that is the chitta, that is the state of consciousness which is subtler than mind. We have distinction in Jain terminology between chitta and mana. Chitta is different from mana. Chitta is a part of consciousness, mana is a material equipment utilized for thinking, etc., through brain. Now, with the help of the psychic color vibration, that is lesia, which affects the psyche and which give rise to the urges and impulses, which is called as bhava. This is the next stage, bhava. Bhava is created in the form of urges and impulses. And now, the bhava, with the help of prana, that is vital energy, result in the arousal of destructive emotions, which may be in the form of patience, that is called kashaya, or no uh, kashaya, or kozai patience, that is no kashaya. Kashaya are anger, conceit, deceit, deceit and greed, and kozai patience are fear, sexuality, etc. The prana that flows in the breath, breath also has a prana, it is called swasoswasa prana, is affected, which is made faster and shallower, Whenever there is arousal of this, such destructive emotions, automatically the breath breathing is faster and shallower and the prana qua breath communicates with the prana qua mind, speech and body through central nervous system, resulting in vitiation of the conduct and behavior and the whole process culminates in attracting new karma. Then new influx of karma results in new bondage and the vicious cycle is again repeated. This is the whole vicious circle, how it works. Now we see how through meditation we reverse it. First of all, when we meditate, subsidence come elimination, there is one state of karma, it occurs, it replaces karmic fusion. Instead of giving the fruit, the karma, it, I say, subsided, or it is eliminated, or it is partly subsided, and partly eliminated. It is called as Kshayopashama, either Kshaya or Upashama or both Kshayopashama. That purifies the Adhyavasaya. It gave message now of equanimity instead of attachment or aversion. Then there is benevolent lesia, the psychic color changes. Then there is purification of Chitta. Then there is purification of Bhava. Then Prana inhibits the kashaya and no kashaya, patience and cozy patience, and stimulates positive emotion instead of destructive emotion. In this way, the breathing becomes slower, longer and deeper, and the activities of mind, speech and body, that is motor activities, all become positive and thus facilitating deeper practice of preksha meditation and thus the whole vicious circle is reversed and in this way a person becomes more and more pure and ultimately it can gain the ultimate goal that is nirvana or moksha. Now I want to give you certain uh, practical uh, 
uh, uh, empirical this, uh, studies made on this system. These are the some, some stories are there. First of all, we have applied this taxonomic system in education. More than 10,000 schools we have selected from all over India with the help of government also and non-government school, in which we have carried on this uh, Praksham meditation and we have given the name Science of Living, a complete syllabus is made. And uh, we have found that uh, very effective in the field of education, there are ample empirical evidence involving measurement through EEG, EMG, ECG, etc., which show that overall development of the emotional, mental, and physical health of the students has considerably been enhanced through science of living, which is application of Reksha meditation in education. I want to suggest here that uh, all these things which are, we are doing now, we are thinking about the contemporary practices, etc. If we can do one thing, we can bring in education the regular course curriculum of some kind of contemplative practices which can bring about overall cultivation of positive behavior and emotion in students from the very beginning. We can change the map of the world. This is what we should do together after proper scientific investigation. We can give this to the education system. And if the global education system accepts that this is the way how education can become more fruitful. Education does not mean, mean only the uh, provision of livelihood or career. It must give a student how to live a life as a human being in his individual life, in his social life, in his family life, and that, that can be inculcated through proper um, curriculum of contemplation in education. Another application is under the supervision of expert physicians. Perfect scientific experiments have been performed which have proved that Prexamit system can be used as an alternative therapy. The most successful application is in the reversal of coronary heart disease. Dr. S. C. Manchanda, who is present here, under his supervision, he, is the, he was formerly the head of the department in All India Medical Institute, under his supervision, more than 20,000 patients, after thorough investigation, they have been implemented, this uh, system, and the coronary heart disease that is reversed. Yes. So in this way, so many applications we can find in the field of drug addiction. Thousands and thousands of people, they have given up drugs, and uh, immunity is increased in cancer, in AIDS, that is found, and uh, subjective change also has been made and uh, there is the application of this system in sociological fields to uh, juvenile delinquencies in jails, prisoners, and etc. And also to uh, address this uh, problem of Naxalite nowadays, we have chosen some areas in uh, Jharkhand and Bihar and give their training in non-violence to people who have no nothing no money, no, they are so poor, they are given also self-employment treatment uh, techniques and this kind of techniques and we, have bring, uh, we are trying to bring about a non-violent socio-economic change there. Now what we accept, uh, expect from the scientists, a systematic research design should be suggested so that multidisciplinary investigation can be undertaken in the field of education, health, psychology, sociology, socio-economics, I think that this conference, if can give this inspiration to our Indian scientists and other scientists who are here to make a systematic plan to implement these contemplative practices in practical life and just change the whole uh, scenario through this, I think this will be the greatest contribution of our uh, ancient traditions of contemplation and meditation and through which we can bring about, we can, uh, we can make a new world order which will be full of compassion, love, amity. There will be no more violence, no more possessiveness, no more greed. That dream we have to uh, make materialize and convert it into reality and with the help of people like His Holiness, Dalai Lama and all of you, 
I think this dream will come to one day on this globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muriji, for this wonderful synthesis of a scientific analysis of a practice. These flow diagrams really look like a, a scientific piece. And, and the ethical implications of these practices, something that science cannot do. From science, we have never inferred any ethical rules so far. They must come from somewhere else. Now, before I hand on the words to Shirley for the next presentation, His Holiness, would you have any comments? Is there anything that uh, Buddhism <coughs> sees differently? The core Jukto said, That means she's a very young man. The 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 cycle in which karma kind of you know conditions the whole kind of no, ultimately <coughs> mind or chit creates karma, karma creates sort of certain sort of that uh, result. So that's the way the cycle. The cycle. Hmm? Exactly. So in order to achieve, I mean, moksha means cessation of these cycle. forces. No. <clears throat> so ultimately, we have to take care about our mind. Exactly. Uh, so, so basically, it's the same. Same. Thing. Same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then, of course, again, is it more, mean, mean, more mean detailed, detailed yeah, right? then, of course, there are differences. Now, I very much impressed you, see, you your presentation the, on the level of individual sort of the, the body yeah. and mind element and how to purify that apply to the society yes. and to build healthy world. That so that's very good. That we have to do all of this. Whether other people follow or not, that's ah. a different question. <laughs> <laughs> but your, your presentation is very good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's wonderful to see these convergences happening here. Every time we meet with a different discipline, this uh, is what May happens. I interpret? Just nearly 54 years be before, in 1956, uh, our Guru, Acharya Tulsi, met His Holiness Dalai Lama at Rashtrapati Bhavan, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. He introduced Dalai Lama to Acharya Tulsi, our Holiness Guru, and that was the first meeting between um, a Jain uh, tradition and Dalai Lama, and that is now going on since 54 years. Many times he has visited our university, a very remote place in Ladnu, and all the time we have been together in organizing many activities. Thank you. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Shirley, you are now going to present us experimental evidence on effects, effectiveness. We're looking forward. I begin with great reverence to His Holiness and all the other scholars over here. In the next few minutes, I would tell a little bit about the physiology of meditation, a series of studies which we have done over the last 17 years here in India. We have actually studied five meditation techniques. Four of them are from the yoga tradition, like Brahma Kumari's Raja Yoga meditation, and the other three are similar techniques. And one is Vipassana meditation taught by Goenkaji. Yes. Now what we found was that all five techniques, irrespective of what they were, reduced signs of arousal in the body, like the blood pressure reduced, the breath rate was slower, very slow, almost four breaths per minute, the heart rate reduced, and various other signs of reduced metabolic needs, the metabolism was lower. But on the other side, when I once presented this in a government forum, they said, if all these things are reduced, can people perform? Will their performance level be good? So then we did a series of studies to see what are the effects of meditation, particularly on attention and memory. 
And this was because this came as a major objection in introducing meditation in schools. If activation is lower, then children won't study and won't perform well. So we did these studies in the last three years, published them, and we've shown that the meditation techniques improve attention and move, improve memory. But there is a slight paradox here, because normally, attention and memory are associated with increased arousal. For example, if you're paying attention to something, if you're paying attention or if you're trying to memorize something, then your body will be in a state of alertness. Not necessarily tension, but alertness. Yes. So then we said, is there something that we can answer this paradox by going back to traditional yoga texts? So we went back to the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which dates back to approximately 900 BC, and there are two meditative states there described. One is the dharana state, and the other is dhyana. In the dharana state, there is meditative focusing. So you could take up the breath, you could take up an external object, but during that time, the mind is engaged in the object of meditation. It progresses on to the dhyana state, where there is no longer effort, there is no longer attention, but it is just a total absorption in the object. And we have done a series of studies on dharana and dhyana states separately. We've looked at the autonomic variables. You can see here a subject, like the breath rate, the non-invasive blood pressure, and so on, heart rate variability, evoked potentials. So we give stimuli and we get brain waves, where each wave corresponds to a particular part of the brain. So we are able to say which part of the brain is active in a with a particular practice. We've also done some imaging studies, but I'm not going to present that because we've not yet published it. And we also give very simple paper and pencil tasks. Like here is a task for attention. You can see some letters like K, U, H, M, F, T. In a fixed time, very quickly, people have to go through all these letters, canceling only K, only U, only H, only M, F, and T. They make any mistake, we record it. Okay? So that's an attention task. And now we come to our results. What was the difference between dharana and dhyana? First, the first most obvious thing, I'm not going into go, go into great detail what the variables were. GSR is the skin resistance, the breath rate, the heart rate, the, the heart rate variability, certain measures. The, we've put it all in light blue. All of them showed that dhyana, or pure meditation, total absorption in the object, is characterized by total <coughs> reduced physiological arousal. Whereas only in two parameters, that is LF par and HF par, that is the last two, dharana has some reduced arousal, but not as much as dhyana. And when we looked at the evoked potentials, we found that they act at different levels. Dharana influences the brain stem, so that's lower down, and the dhyana, or pure meditation, influences higher up, like the thalamus and the cortex. Now what happens? Information which is coming from the periphery, it could be a sound, it could be a, a needle pricking you, is blocked. So this has a lot of applications. We're thinking the, pos the possibility of applying this, for example, in pain. Can we use these practices to block stimuli which we do not want to attend to, and attend to those stimuli which we want to attend to? So like a patient with pain, maybe the practice of dhyana can block it at one level, the pro practice of dharna can block it at another level. Then maybe it can reduce the requirement or painkillers, for example. But this is very far off. This is not yet done. We are planning it. 
What about attention? Please look only at the middle bar. The light blue tells you before the practice. The red bar tells you after the practice. Now there are five sets here. I want you to look only at the middle one, Excuse where the light. How long is the period of practice? Twenty minutes. But they're trained for three months. And you see here in the middle bar that the scores in an attention task actually improved after dharana, even though they had signs of reduced arousal. So this was a good result. There were 55 individuals in this study. So in summary, we can say that these two states, once we separated it based on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, we got a better answer that dhyana seems to be characterized by pure physiological deactivation. Dharana is a slight mix. There is some activation and some deactivation. Attention is better in dharana. And we are continuing this with certain studies which are going on in our institution. And we look forward maybe to carrying it on further with the grace and blessings of His Holiness uh, with mindfulness meditation. Very Thank good. you. Oh. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Shirley, for this very impressive and concise demonstration of what can be done, also psychophysically. You don't always have to get the big measurement devices to find out a change. His Holiness? Yes. <laughs> So the question that His Holiness has for you uh, is between the distinction between dharana and dhyana. Um, since one is characterized by effortful activity, the other is non effortless. Is it uh, a function of a, a practitioner kind of gaining greater experience and you know culminating in effortless state, or is it actually a two distinct forms of practice? In the original text of Patanjali, dharana should progress on to dhyana. It is the sixth and seventh stage of the ashtanga of Patanjali. But we have now found that you can have dharana types of meditation separately, and a person can not only show objectively, but even experience physio uh, psychologically relaxation with dharana meditation alone and dhyana alone. So it does not necessarily have to be uh, progressing from dharana to dhyana. For example, the Brahma Kumari's Raja Yoga meditation, which has its center in Mount Abu, yes. is very much a dharana type of meditation. We find quite a few signs of activation, like heart rate increase, we've published this. But there are many other signs of deactivation, like metabolic requirements, the oxygen consumed goes down. And they are very relaxed. They are, uh, if you ask them both to rate their relaxation, as well as the alpha and the EEG, it's amazingly increased. So you can have darkness. <laughs> So, His Holiness is wondering whether the distinction is more about object, one with object and one something object less meditation. Yes. In one case, there is something to focus on. In another case, because it is object less meditation, there is nothing to focus on. Is that the distinction? Or no. no? Because in dhyana, you do use an object in the initial phase, but after some time, the object is no longer important through dhyana. The person just uses it as an very, sometimes it can be very transient and get into the state of being totally absorbed without requiring the object anymore. <laughs> So one is wondering whether 
one could look at these two distinctions as one being conceptual, there is at the level of thought, and then the other, the dhyana, being non-conceptual, kind of thoughtless state. Yes, yes, very much. That's in fact how we do describe it. <laughs> So, for example, if we were to take the example of, say, someone meditating on their transient nature, the impermanence. So, at the initial stage, they, you know, one takes impermanence as the object of meditation, focuses upon it, there will be effortful state, and then as he or she progresses as a, you know, as a result of this focused attention, would you say at one point, in principle, that dharana state can kind of culminate into your dhyana yes, state? Yes, yes. In Nisha. fact, let me just put it in a different way. In the dharana type of meditation, the person remains thinking about the object. object. Ah. Suppose Nisha. like it's om. You think about yes. the attributes of om. What is the significance of om? What is... Uh, how, does it, how is it written in Sanskrit? You may think of different aspects of Om. And if it's the dharana meditation, you may remain only doing that, and that's all right. But in the dhyana stage, the attributes of Om are just required for a few seconds to take the person into a stage where there are no longer thoughts that Om means this, Om looks like this. It is a thoughtless state where the person and Om, as if mentally, are one. So, can I ask a question? So, sorry. Um, but still, that doesn't answer the point about that does dhyana actually require a precedent of dharna type practice? There are a few meditations where they get into the dhyana state without dharana. Yeah, but these individuals might have done dharana type practices before. Original, uh, yeah. definitely. Risha. Definitely. Risha. Risha. definitely. Risha. They're most definitely. Yeah, Java Jamaica is a marva. The Java Jones is a marva. He's a marina. Jane Jock is a marva. So this is not a question of whether disc there is a discursive discursiveness or absence of discursiveness, that's not the distinction here. The distinction is whether there is effort, effort. and effortless. Effort. effort and thought. Thought, yeah. Yes. 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 So, say for example, in both of these cases, like particularly the dharana, is it at the, 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 the object that one takes it, is it at the level of ma mind or is it actually a visual object that you take? It can be both. For example, at the start of a, a dharana on om, you may actually keep your eyes open yes. and looking at an om symbol and then close your eyes and visualizing it. Yes. But it need not necessarily. Oh, yes. So, this makes sense because we use the visual object. So, so the definitely the object that is being taken on is really an image rather than the physical object. The physical object is only as a kind of a, a, a medium, a vehicle, media to get to the, the, the mental image. Yes. Because in the Buddhist text, there is a similar discussion of what is the ex exact nature of the meditation object. And they're referred to as a kind of a, a form, a mental form. It's how you perceive it in your mind yeah. or in your mental state. Doesn't that the penatala mean in the dhanada? So in that case, can you have these two types of meditation, dharana and dhyana, in relation to taking sound as an object? Yes. Yes. We have asked them to try it with the mental chanting. 
So in this case, the, you know, just to clarify, His Holiness is asking, say, if a person is cultivating dharna type meditation in relation to a sound, so the person will be literally hearing a sound first. Yes. Of course. Yes. But, but then, and, um, then it's mainly imagery, right? Yeah. It's imagery that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Image. Yeah. Image. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's right. No. Yeah. And that could be measured, of course. One can measure mm. the brain activity that is associated with imagery, and it differs slightly from the activity that is associated with perceiving concretely objects. That's my now yours. Leave it Should we proceed? Yes. And, and hear what uh, HR Nagendra has to say because I think it links us up yeah. closely. It's Father, a follow up uh, in and complimentary. Then, then, then another one question. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Then, can you remember Julia? Hello. Can you speak? Can you speak? So, kind of a from a phenomenological point of view, um, um, Say, for example, if someone has an illusion of something, or maybe someone did something or something, um, and then as you mentally be f totally fixated on this, be focused on this. Of course, that this, person, unless some person make correction, he or she believe it is true. So now become more familiar that then I should and do it. So can you kind of uh, envision the possibility that this, for this person, initially it may be his own thought projection, but then as a result of very long habituation, this could become like an effort, effortless state, like a dhyana. So can one speak of dharna and dhyana in relation to even to these kind of distorted perceptions? In fact, that we, have, lot of marriage. we have tried to do a little work on this in patients with schizophrenia, where their perception is distorted. So can one bring them from distorted perception, that's one, a psychiatric disorder, or distorted perception in terms of geometric optical illusions, like the railway lines appear to meet when they go to a distance. So can we see which of these practices reduce this type of disorders of perception? Dharana appears better than dhyana, maybe because there is some attention, no yeah. substrate still there. Yeah. Thank you. So, please, Dr. Wanda, you need the... We may have a logistic problem. Didn't you load it on this? Yeah, got it here. The way did? So maybe we can continue discussing while technique is. Ms. Olens was saying that it's <laughs> trying to resolve itself. Ms. Olens was saying that it is wonderful that this kind of research has mm. already been done to be able to distinguish. Oh. This first time I know, I learned such sort of experiment using actually or research actually carrying here. Yeah. Wonderful. Here we are. So similar sort of research yes. in America yes. and here in India. Wonderful. <laughs> His Holiness, Dalai Lama Ji, 
Muniji, expert scientists, my dear brothers and sisters, I bring greetings from Bangalore. Our university is called Swami Vivekananda Yoga Anusandhan Samsthan. And what Dr. Shirley presented, Dharana and Dhyana, has got close relation to what Pujya Swamiji talked about as two ways to eliminate the ego. The ego can be expanded to infinity, or ego can be diffused to zero through the Bhakti Yoga and the Jnana Yoga. I would like to present briefly the dimensions. The Jnana Yoga is the term used for Vedanta, the Advaita Vedanta that he had presented. It is the path of intellect, the path of analysis. And I give a schematic here to give the whole picture of the Jnana Yoga in a very picturesque way. Already Swamiji has mentioned the steps, Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana, leading to enlightenment or Jnana. Then when the Jnana gets stabilized, it is called Jivan Mukti, Jivan Neva Mukti. That's also described as Sthita Pragna in the Bhagavad Gita. Then as the person expands further to higher and higher levels, what Pujya His Holiness talked about this morning, higher levels of consciousness, in which you have the higher powers that come up as different siddhis, you know, person living fresh after the death of the body and several other things, all come under what we call as advanced Jnana Yoga. And that <coughs> it reach is moksha, the eternal freedom, freedom from all miseries, freedom from all bondages. That is the great teaching that the great Master Swami Vivekananda has given us. And here, the essential feature is to cleanse the mind, as beautifully brought out by Muniji also. And what is mind? In yoga, it is not merely functioning of brain. Functioning of brain is manifestation of something happening deeper. Like electricity is there, bulb is there, light is coming out. Light is manifestation. Similarly, functioning of the brain, the EEG signals, are all manifestations of the mind deeper. Then how do you define mind? Patanjali says, collection of thoughts, conglomeration of thoughts, chitta vrittis. When the chitta vrittis are there, it is called as the mind. You know? And gaining mastery over the mind is the key essence of Patanjali Yoga. The name given by Swami Vivekananda to that is called Raja Yoga. It is the path of willpower, in which we have the famous eight-limbed yoga called Ashtanga Yoga, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi is called the Antaranga Yoga. The first five limbs are called the Bahiranga Yoga. Bahiranga means external, grass, use the body, do the breathing, use the senses to gain control and mastery over the mind to purify the mind. Whereas in dharana, dhyana, samadhi, you directly go to the mind and cleanse the mind and gain control and mastery over the mind. This leads to samadhi. Samadhi is in a sense, as Swamiji said, is the beginning of really the higher levels of spirituality. After that, you have several types of samadhi mentioned which takes you ultimately to Kaivalya, or Nirvana, or Moksha. Dharana. Dharana is the one that she has talked about. The first step in the mind is the random mind, called Chanchalata. Lot of subjects which are jumping from one thought to another thought. All our effort in our education system is to bring concentration. On one subject, the mind dwells on that. Whereas in Dharana, you have a single thought in which you are going to fix. So here, exactly. we are moving from mind to intellect in concentration. And in dharana, we are moving from intellect to memory. You know, The process of dharana is focusing up the mind on a single thought. As Dr. Shirley pointed out, you have a physical object like a candle flame. You go on watching that with eyes open. This is called trataka. And this helps to build the dharana. Dharana is focusing in which you are constricting, constricting the ego 
and making it smaller and smaller. One day, overcome the Maya and then get out of it. You know? So dharana is like focusing of all your energies on a single thought, and it's like a lens burning up the paper or a laser. In our earlier times, the people were taught this dharana like the Arjuna trying to hit the eye of the parrot, the center of the eye of the parrot. No? That is the example of the dharana. So dharana is the memory way. Trataka is a way to build it. And here, it is not a physical persistence of the image in the eye, but it is a deeper recollection of the memory comes into picture. So dharana proceeds of recall. You know, it's a memory level. It works. So from dharana, the next step is dhyana. In dharana, there is focusing. In dhyana, the opposite of that. There is deep focusing. You know, expansion, expansion. If dharana brings the ego down, the dhyana expands. You know? Effortless dharana can be called as dhyana in a way. What are the features of dhyana then? There is a single thought. Essentially, in dhyana, you have a sound. Whereas in dharana, it's essentially the picture as His Holiness was mentioning in a nice way. There is a single thought, there is a slowness, there is a wakefulness, effortlessness, and a feeling of expansion, a feeling of lightness. You start feeling lighter and lighter, like the flowering of a bud. You know? There is a fragrance that starts coming. So, the whole essence of Antaranga Yoga is to move from dharana to dhyana, and from there you go to the samadhi. Samadhi is a sort of jump from one level of consciousness to the next level. You know? I give the example of Samadhi and the definition is like this, that in all our transactions we have three things. The seer, seen and the process of seeing. I am talking, the subject of the talk and the process of talking. There is a trifold process. Even in meditation, there is the meditator, meditated and the process of meditation. When the three things become one, it's called samadhi. Becoming one with the seen is samadhi. So samadhi can be on anything. That is the one that has been defined by Patanjali, Tadeva Arthamatra Nirbhasa, Swarupa Shunyam Iva Samadhi, as he defines that. You know? And here, I feel there is a comparison to the physical world. In the physical world, there is a quantum jump of electrons. When it goes on absorbing energy at some level, it jumps to a higher orbit. Something like that happens in the mind also. And Samadhi jumps from one level of consciousness to the higher level of consciousness when there is a merger that takes place. That takes you to the higher level of consciousness. Really. And what features Samadhi is that there is tremendous amount of happiness, bliss. That is the bliss of the higher level of consciousness. There is a feeling of expansion and lightness. And deep knowledge start coming up and there is greater power featured by greater creativity and greater dimensions. And this is the wonderful experience that Sri Ramakrishna Prabhamsa exhibited in his life when he went into Samadhi. And when into Samadhi, he was in such a blissful state. You know? And we had a classic example of Girish Ghosh and he was the drunkard of the times. And he was all the time in a drunken state. Everybody said, except for this drunken state, how wonderful you'll be. Why don't you leave? Then Giri said, no, 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 why should I leave? I'm getting so much of happiness. You know? Somebody said, why don't you go to Sri Ramakrishna Parabhamsa and he will do the things. So Girisha was very sincere, very nice person. He came to Ramakrishna and at that time Ramakrishna Parabhamsa was just coming out. He heard some bhajans, he went into Bhava Samadhi. He was standing like this in that wonderful Samadhi state. And Girish was looking at him. You know, one minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Then slowly Ramakrishna comes back to the normal sea. Then Girish asks, What brand? <laughs> <laughs> what brand? <laughs> then Ramakrishna says, God brand. <laughs> Do you want? Come, I will teach. He completely transferred the drunkard of a Girish into a fantastically great personality. That is the power of Samadhi that has been talked about in these things. You know? So through regular abhyasa, practice, 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 the purification takes place, as Muniji also mentioned, 
and you can reach this higher state. What is the result of this uh, samadhi? Practice of meditation samadhi leads to mastery over all the senses and emotions. That's why the values start coming up. You overcome the fear, greed, anger, miserliness, because you are at a higher stage. And the universal love starts coming up. So Vivekananda's wonderful speech in Chicago, he talked about the universal brotherhood, Radha's love for Sri Krishna. And our His Holiness Dalai Lama's wonderful love for all. Mm. You know, such a fantastic thing. These are all the benefits or the qualities of the higher states of consciousness. Shunichai Vashwapake, Japanditaha, Samadakshinaha, as it is said. And these are the features of the higher states of the consciousness. It leads to peace, silence, transcendence, ultimate reality. Call it Brahman, call it Nirvana, call it Kaivalya, call it Moksha, whatever time. And this goes on through conscious, effortless effort for many, many lives, purifying till the end, features a great yogi. You know? This is the whole dimension of this thing. And I'm very, very thankful for you for this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Narendra. So, uh, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, in your presentation, um, so this is all really focused on samadhi and dharna and dhyana states and so on. Um, there was no reference to sort of um, any parallel to in what in Buddhist tradition we have something called vipassana. No, not only Buddhism, Buddhism no. but also non-Buddhism. Non-Buddhist non tradition. The, uh, vipassana. Vipassana, it's sort of more... Hmm. It's insight, insight. Oh. Samadhi? So, samadhi? Hmm. Uh, I said like... Super consciousness. Instrument. Hmm. Hmm. And that instrument now used for uh, Vipassana. Really? Really? So, for example, um, you know, in our ordinary untrained state of mind, our mind is naturally so restless and distracted that we're not able to channel our focus to do anything effectively. So therefore, cultivation of single-pointedness and stability of the mind becomes very important. And therefore, in the traditions, we see a lot of techniques for developing kind of single-pointedness, even to the point of effortless mm. dhyana or samadhi states. But once one has attained that state, then you have this ability to channel your mind and focus. Then, in, in, in traditions such as Buddhism, then there is a discussion of how that focused mind should be used to investigate and penetrate into the nature of reality. So we just no, refer no, to... Not only Buddhism. Other sometimes such to say shame. It comes from such to say shame. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. So he's all... 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 He's so, uh, His Holiness is wondering whether there is, you know, because his understanding was that when it comes to the practice of samadhi and vipassana, insight, uh, it was a common part of the common currency of all classical Indian traditions. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of presentation that is very, you know, articulate about the description of the samadhi process, getting the single-pointedness mind, focused mind, yeah, stable it comes mind. From mm -hmm. For example, we find discussions of the, the, the levels of mind that are indicative of the three realms, the desire realm, the form realm. Amadadu, Rubadadu, Arubadadu. Arubadadu, formless realm. Uh, yeah. So there are descriptions, for example, in the Buddhist um, meditation manuals or manuals on meditative states, 
how one moves from the, the preliminary stages of effortful you know, concentration then to the first level of form and second level of form and third level of form and then transcending form into a formless state mm -hmm. and progressively getting subtler and subtle levels of formlessness. Right. So in all of these cases, the understanding is that it's not simply a function of the refinement of the samadhi, but there is also a complementary factor of insight. So it's both a comp combination of the samadhi as well as uh, vipassana, insight. Mm. Uh, so one of the you know the the, uh, the 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 techniques of the meditation involve comparing you know states of mind of the you know higher levels higher realms to a lower realm and, and making a contrasting of subtlety and and coarseness so in this way progressively one gets to a subtler subtler state i think the concept of dhamma dhatu ruba dhatu a ruba dhatu i think common isn't it Karma Dadu. Karma Dadu, Ruba Dadu, So here also, you move through one Samadhi, then again you use Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi as what is called as Sayama to go to the higher, next level. Insights will grow. You start fathoming the laws of creation to a greater depth. So like that you go on going, Patanjali describes eight types of samadhis. You know? There you have sampragnata, asampragnata. Asampragnata is complete silence, then again the new dimension comes up. So like that goes from one level to the higher level until we reach the Kaivalya. So what Valira uh, says is correct, you know? that insights will grow. Yeah. Just a small Further yeah. to, as mm. Dr. Nagendra said, as the uh, person reaches the state of pure uh, quietitude, then insight automatically happens. Mm. The, uh, there is perfect freedom of the mind, and in that quiet state, insight and interoception, what is happening within the body, become automatic. リパシーゴシャリオンベソルシマトチェトニナハンダンゴンベイムタナオンデコンサトタニタギソマレノアンダダナンベシュンナロアラベナティンジアデシネトビアリアセムネコセムジョバキュンドジョバレンジジョバテ
there are descriptions of how to systematically go through, for example, like nine stages of mental development. So he was wondering whether there is any similar instructions on how one goes through these stages step by step. Up to reach samadhi. Mm. Oh. Exactly. It goes on improving and stay for longer and longer time and with mm. less and less distractions with a single thing. Then when you stay there for a long time, suddenly an explosion takes place, an expansion. Ah, I got it, mm -hmm. what Swamiji was describing. That expansion is called as Samadhi. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as one of the qualities of the Samadhi state, um, you pointed out bliss. So in this place, um, in the Buddhist tradition, we speak of Xinjiang, uh, Karsa, Sanskrit, Xinjiang, Prashaptirwa, Prashrapti. In, in Buddhism, there is a, a term, kind of, you know, pliancy of body and mind. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the marks of attainment of Samadhi is you attain a certain suppleness or pliancy of body and mind. And along with it comes bliss. <laughs> So first the pliancy of body attains, and then pliancy of the mind, and then there is a bliss arising from the suppleness of the mind, and which then give rise to a bliss at the body level. Mm. So, so is, yeah. is it similar? Yeah, very similar. Very similar. Yeah. So I, I would like also to, to um, give respect to uh, Dr. Gangadhar could not come and uh, give the word to Richie to comment on this and then to also summarize maybe very briefly what he would have said had he come, so that we have him sitting here. I, I want to first make a comment about um, one aspect of this discussion, the idea uh, that uh, Shirley, I think, uh, mentioned interception, which is the perception of one's own body that may come effortlessly with this practice. Uh, there is a way to measure this very rigorously and objectively uh, using modern scientific methods. And it, it's quite a, a, a simple and clever procedure, I think. What we can do is to present a series of tones to a person so they get 10 tones and in one case, those tones are precisely coincident with the heartbeat. So you get a tone with each heartbeat. And the person's heartbeat is being measured, and the heartbeat actually triggers the tone. So the tones are precisely synchronized with the heartbeat. In another case, they get the 10 tones that are not synchronized to their heartbeat. And the practitioner is simply asked to say, do the first 10 tones correspond to your heartbeat or do the second 10 tones correspond to your heartbeat? And on each trial, they have to make a decision. Is it the first set of tones or the second set of tones that corresponds to your own heartbeat? So we... Interceptions <laughs> So we gave this test to a group of, um, uh, uh, of uh, very advanced practitioners, uh, our uh, long-term practitioners in the Tibetan tradition, and also long-term practitioners in Kundalini Yoga tradition. And one of the things we did is we asked them, after we gave them the task, how confident were you on each trial? How confident were you in perceiving your own heartbeat? And um, we had two groups of meditators, the, the long-term Tibetan practitioners and the Kundalini practitioners, and a group of controls who've never meditated. And the, both the Tibetan and the Kundalini practitioners rated their confidence as very high that they were able to perceive their own heartbeat. But when we measured it objectively, no difference from normal controls. 
Uh, absolutely no difference. So the only difference was that they thought they were better, <laughs> but they really weren't better at all. Yeah, the plans they gave us, they gave us a lot of problems. Because they didn't do so much at all. They did the 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 that showed that people differ very much in their ability to judge confidently what they have perceived. And they really fall into two groups. There are people who um, think they are right and they are not right, and there are others who think that they were not very good, but they were very good. And if one looks into the brain in a very bias-free, with a very bias-free method, what is the difference between those people? one finds that there is a, a small part of the cerebral cortex in the frontal brain <clears throat> that is more expanded and more developed in the people who have the right introspection, who, who, who are right in saying so, so. whether they are confident so, 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 or what, how confident their judgment was. Or so. I'm surprised that the meditators so weren't better. But. And, um, would you like to, to, to sure. recite briefly what... Uh, Professor Gaganda would have said, had uh, he been here. Yes, so Professor uh, Gangadhar's uh, father was ill and unfortunately couldn't be with us today. And uh, he is a psychiatrist uh, uh, who in India who has done some very important... Uh, very important... Uh, very important research, uh, mostly looking at the effects of... Uh, certain yoga practices, uh, Sudarsha Kriya Yoga in particular. And uh, most of the studies that uh, he has done have been in clinical populations. Uh, so he has looked at patients with depression, he has looked at uh, patients with alcoholism, uh, and also patients with schizophrenia. And he has examined the impact of these breathing practices, pranayam, uh, in these different clinical conditions. And this, many of these papers have been published, and uh, this is a very extensive body of research. And it indicates that, in general, these practices can be very beneficial uh, in these clinical conditions. And his work um, uh, shows that it's not just uh, improvements on the patient's own reports of their symptoms, but also on certain biological measures. Uh, one of the measures that he uses is cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Uh, and he finds that cortisol uh, is significantly reduced by these practices. Uh, in patients with depression in particular. And uh, one of the um, really nice things about some of his work as well is that uh, he has included some comparison conditions, uh, not just untreated individuals, but he, for example, uh, in one of his studies compares the yoga practice to physical exercise and finds that the yoga practice actually is in this case was more beneficial than simple physical exercise. So, um, although the physical exercise did have some benefit. Uh, so, um, uh, that, those are the principal findings and uh, he is now beginning to do work looking at the effects on the brain, although that work is just beginning, but uh, it is work that's now being done in India, and I think uh, this is uh, some very important work and uh, will contribute to the body of work in contemplative neuroscience. Thank you, Richie. That's very helpful. So it spreads. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> So Raj, I wonder whether you, you want to give a meta-analysis of what you have heard, being a cognitive scientist, and they know... 
usually better? Um, I'll try. Um, actually, the, over the last few days, I mean, two days, we have heard from both representatives of various Indian traditions, from Muniji, from Swamiji, from uh, Ram Prasad and Tupton, as well as people who have done um, scientific research on contemplative practices, from Richie and Matthew, from Shirley and Dr. Nagendra. And for a scientist like me who's interested in these traditions, it is a very rich array of knowledge and discovery, perhaps almost confusingly rich. And uh, I'm just trying to make sense of the diversity and see if there is a unity here to be shared, not primarily, I would say, with the Indian scientists here, but also with the other scholars and practitioners, because I do believe that this is a wonderful moment and opportunity to create something new in this country. And the first thought that came to my mind was that contemplative science is a, an attempt to bring the first and the third person together in an integrated form of inquiry into the human mind and the human brain. Now that is something that neither contemplation nor science by itself can do. So to be able to bring these two together is something which is exciting at every level. As a scientist, it addresses the theoretical questions that I study, but also in terms of the study of human well-being, I think that it offers an opportunity that we perhaps have never had in history before. And so uh, what we heard over the last two days from the people who have presented experimental studies is how there are measurable effects that can be detected by studying advanced and sometimes even not so advanced practitioners of contemplative uh, pra uh, practices. I would like to add one more to this list, which is that the theoretical basis or the philosophical basis of these two traditions also need to be brought together, right? That, that the, what was talked about yesterday, that neuroscience comes from a very specific history of European post-enlightenment thought. And that the Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, yoga, all these traditions, which also have a very long history of working on these very questions, can also be integrated with the theories in the cognitive and brain sciences. So in particular, I feel that what's now emerging in cognitive science as an extremely important subdiscipline, which is called embodied cognition. As uh, Your Holiness, you must know that uh, Francisco Varela was very uh, central to these developments. And embodied cognition and the role of the body-mind complex in the constitution of cognition, I believe, is a very important discipline within the sciences which brings together both the neuroscientific basis and the psychological basis of cognition, but is also, I think, deeply compatible with the Indic traditions in general. Because I do, in the Indic traditions, as you must know, there isn't a strict dualistic metaphysics which distinguishes the mind from the body, or in more modern terms between the software which is typically thought of in computational terms as a computer, and the hardware which is thought of primarily in physical terms in terms of the brain and the physiology of the body. So I do believe that there is now enough ideas in the cognitive sciences to actually to bring all of this together into one discipline. Um, and that discipline I see as a science of human nature in which well-being is as important as the study of perception or um, um, cogni you know, concepts or language, which were the traditional preoccupations of the cognitive sciences and the neurosciences. But that well-being, as a constitutive aspect of human nature, should be as central to this new contemplative neuroscience. And that not only will that um, help you know, scientists 
I, I do hope that if this goes further, the phase change that you, Wolf, you mentioned in the previous session, that that phase change, which may be ready to happen, could happen if we brought in the best of the theoretical ideas that we have with the rapid advance in neuroscience and the um, collected wisdom of the... So one specific idea that I would want to share as to how to do this might be that the traditional um, Indian framework of the Pramana system, which is shared across all the traditions, might be a way to bring all of these together into one framework. And as you know that unlike the modern sort of computational approaches to the mind, these are fundamentally cognitive approaches to the mind and knowledge. And that if we think of human nature as based on cognitions rather than on computations, perhaps there's a possibility to have a framework that brings all of this together. Um, of course, that is more of a theorist dream, but at a practical level, at a, at a practical level, of course, a science of human nature which incorporates well-being, I, I don't think we need to say any more about what usefulness it would have. I mean, from education to um, addressing complex issues like climate change, I think that the uh, a, a well thought out and well researched science of well being, I think, will be important for everybody. But I do think that in order to have that, you know, to echo the British philosopher Bertrand Russell, he once said that um, people who read Plato do not know mathematics, and people who know mathematics do not know Plato. And I wish to echo that and say, and to reverse it and say that if people who read Nagarjuna, know neuroscience, and if people who know neuroscience read Nagarjuna, I think we'll all be better off for it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 uh, Raji, thank you. Um, fr from my observation after those days here, and being at the same time member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which is exactly the other camp, <laughs> um, this is a purely scientific organization, so it's, it has nothing to do with the, with the curie and the hierarchy. Mm. But the problem I see is that the Buddhist view of the world and the emphasis on changing oneself for the betterment of mankind is, is very much compatible with science. It's much closer. There is not this ontological dualism that we have in, 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 in the monotheistic religions. Um, there is much more tolerance towards um, yeah, pragmatic ways of finding solutions to the world. Now, the problem I see is, and I see this perhaps less in Europe than in America, um, which we need to get in the boat, after all, because there is where the power is in the moment still. It may not last very long. But how, how to get what we learn here uh, into a format that, now let me use a commercial term, that can be sold to find acceptance. Because um, it will certainly not be easy um, in the domains where the Catholic Church or the, even the Protestant or Reformed Church is dominant uh, to sell a worldview that is not ontologically dualistic, um, that takes away from the individual certain um, autonomy and responsibility towards the Almighty. 
Um, so one has to think about a, a package, how one can redefine and clean from all religious idiosyncrasies. As you said, we need a celestic ethic. But it is not yet clear to me how this can be done easily. And we, ha we, we haven't talked about Islam so far. It's also a monotheistic religion. And most of the problems we're facing in the moment, I think, are with these incompatibilities between these different ways of thinking. And um, maybe, we, it, well, this is not the place to talk about it, but for the future, uh, we may have to consider those aspects as well. Uh, it's a great beginning that this happens here in India, but it's a natural place to happen, much more natural than anywhere else in the world. So um, maybe this could... Uh, <laughs> What's your experience with us? I mean, with the Western world, His Holiness. When you go there and talk, talk to the leading people. Uh, it's in my experience, and also it's in my effort. You see, religious matter, I mean, certain sort of practice which is related with uh, religious, faith. religious faith, it is individual business. Uh, what we need is something which can cover entire humanity, entire world. So that's why I'm trying to make clear we need secular ethics. Uh, then if we think, you see, the, so the properly, secular ethics not against any religious faith. In fact, all religious faith develop according to the principle of secular ethics. Secular ethics very much related with biological factor. This is my view. So, so some uh, creator or no creator or next life <laughs> or no next life, these are personal matter. Uh, whatever you like, you follow it. No problem. <laughs> but at the same time, you see, these, I think the Buddhist concept, you see, cannot cover all human beings. Humanity. All humanity. And because the monotheistic religious belief also is it cannot cover that. All humanity. Uh, I think we, we Buddhists and we Jain, you see, we, <laughs> we believe the law of causality rather than creator, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> no creator. <laughs> so, strictly speaking, we two non believer. <laughs> so, so, in any way, these are, I feel, is a personal matter. And each have sort of, sort of special things to impact in individual human mind. Some individual, the concept of creator is so beautiful, so powerful, very good. Uh, other day also I mentioned, you see, the total submission to God through sheer faith reduce self-centered attitude, isn't it? <coughs> we Buddhists, you see, the, in order to reduce self-centered attitude, egoism, uh, uh, through concept of anatma theory, now here we also have some barrier. Uh, you believe Atma, Atma. I do not believe an Atma. <laughs> even, even within Buddhist, you see, there are some barriers. <laughs> Pali tradition, Sanskrit tradition, within Sanskrit tra tradition, the follow of Chitta Mantra and follow of Madhimika, there's demarcations. <laughs> it's endless. 
I think some Buddhist literature mentioned, so long human brain remained there, uh, difference is always there. Right. <laughs> 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 There is an uh, expression, there is a line in one of the uh, Buddhist texts that so long as human thoughts remain, proliferation of philosophical ideas will never come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's true, that's fact. Yeah. Uh, so we need, you see, uh, some kind of ethics which can cover entire humanity. Right. Now, like science, Universal principle, universal sort of uh, practice. Uh, practice. So this is something, uh, some sort of moral principle, moral ethics, which based on uh, biological factor, and that cover everybody. And now important is, uh, usually see people never sort of look seriously about our inner values, only money value. Isn't it? Now India also now getting more and more interest about money, isn't it? Oh, more greed. And including some minister, you see, now a lot of corruptions. <laughs> These are the indication. You see, forgetting about our inner value and principle matter. So this is, so I think everywhere, you see, that's the situation. So we must, uh, now law, uh, very good law, for example, India, rule of law, and the free media, right? Yeah. So that bring these sort of, because of corruption in some extent. But still, ultimately, without self-discipline, clean society, very difficult. Not possible. Oh, yes, not possible. You mm. see, self-discipline is the key factor to healthy society, healthy family, isn't it? So, the self-discipline, you see, m come only through certain conviction. Conviction from faith, shaky. Conviction through investigation, through research, find fact. Wow. Then, uh, everybody is selfish. So, you see, for self-interest, you see, you need certain sort of principle. When people realize that, like you see, carrying one's own body, everybody, no need law, everybody should take care. Similarly, taking care of our sort of mind, mental inner mind, health, uh, mental, health, mental health. Mental health. So that's the main, uh, my main sort of emphasis on that level. So I never discuss about certain Buddhist unique sort of thinking with scientists. No, this is Buddhist business. Uh, so. Now, another word, sorry. Just last, uh, uh, yesterday and today, I really felt now we are uh, reach uh, something like spiritual supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Your presentation, oh, wonderful. Oh, your presentation, wonderful. So that, one danger, create more confusion. <laughs> <laughs> so we need more detailed sort of study. And I think it's important to make clear what's differences. That also I think is necessary. Isn't it? Otherwise, you see, there is real danger. You see there? Now, what's the differences between Buddhism and Jainism and Hinduism? No differences. Everybody is talking about the clear light or smart or all these things. <laughs> <laughs> so that I think if if these traditions are truly same, then the thousand years of these great masters, I think they they kasure. So it would imply that they were all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. so in any way, anyway, I really sort of yes. uh, appreciate yeah. our meeting. I think my scientist friend also, I think now, I think now you felt such meeting took place in India and more participate from ancient 
the Indian different sort of spiritual sort of that traditions. Uh, traditions. Really enriching, isn't it? Yes. Really, it's worthwhile. So I'm really happy. Very good. Wonderful. I think there is a psychological phenomenon which is called the recency effect. Even though we have a few more minutes to go, I think we should really stop here because there is nothing to be added. And in order for this to sink and to have an effect, um, a little bit of calm would perhaps be good. And I would like to just finish this session here in the moment and then we have a 15 minute break. Um, and then we re reconvene for the open discussion. That's all. So, right. His Holiness, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.